Hi, I'm Captain Madeline. And I'm Captain Joe. We are absolutely excited to be leading the official 2022 Beaverworks Summer Institute Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Challenge Expedition. As we set sail on our journey, we'll start by developing some essential life skills like VIM, GREP, and of course, shell and C programming. We will apply these fundamental skills to program surface and underwater robots to perform basic loitering, surveying, and transit behaviors. We then teach our robots to be unshellfish team members with behaviors like collision avoidance and swarm formation. Once we've shored up these techniques, we ought to be prepared to enter the deep end of the challenge. In this challenge, students will work in pods to program schools of underwater and surface vehicles to execute an orchestrated search and survey of an area. Points will be accrued as the autonomous robot teams compete to monitor fish schools, survey shipwrecks, and collect treasure. But the true purpose of the AUV challenge is to make friends and have fun. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for our uh, Autonomous Vehicle Challenge uh, retrospective and award show, I suppose. Or actually, uh, uh, they'll get the student presentations first. I'll give an overview of the uh, course as we went through it over the last four weeks. Uh, I can find the slides. Great. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, welcome to the 2022 Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Challenge. Um, this is our second year for Madeline and I to, to teach this course, uh, though this course is completely different from the 2021 challenge. So if you go to the next slide. So the lead instructors were myself uh, and, and, and Madeline Miller, as you saw in the video. Uh, we are both staff members at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory working in under, advanced undersea systems and technology. Um, we work together all the time and this course is uh, just one of the many things that we do together. Uh, and so it's an honor to work with Madeline to put together this course. Next. And our, we uh, couldn't accomplish this, this uh, course without the contributions of our, uh, the rest of the staff, including our teaching assistants, uh, starting from the left, Ashley Kamal, who is a repeat uh, teaching assistant. We liked her so much last year. That in the past year, she both uh, has been hired as a full-time employee to work with us uh, and also promoted to first uh, lieutenant in the course. So she was sort of the lead TA this year because she had pre prior experience. And we were very lucky to, to, to find both Dan Pearson and Michael Rivera, who both had uh, a wide variety of skills they could apply to the course because it's not an easy course to TA, especially since we more or less make it up as we go along and the TAs get hours to days notice of the things that we're going to do. And they have to be one step ahead of the students that can help them. And they both did it. All three did a phenomenal job of that uh, this year. We're really lucky to have them. So next, of course, the, we also had uh, IT support. We had a strong amount of, of IT needed for the remote work uh, that, that we had this year. And for the last two years, it's been, the course has been fully remote. So we do everything online, as you've probably seen your, your kids uh, attached to the computer all day long. We tried to get them to stand up a bit and get some break from their screen time. But at the same time, we had to get we had a lot to get done. So we had uh, IT professional slash Dr. Evan Leventhal uh, help us with that. And we had three guest lecturers uh, ranging from uh, oceanographic researcher uh, Nicholas Beard to uh, shark photographer George Probst to uh, uh, marine robotics expert, uh, Professor John Leonard from MIT, in addition to all the uh, Beaverworks uh, larger program seminars that went on almost every day in a whole wide variety of topics. These were specific to our course. Okay, next. But what really makes the course are the students. Um, and uh, we do while we do control for a certain, uh, so there's, a, there's a, sp a spring course that everybody has to do um, it's self-paced, and then uh, the students who complete the spring course apply to the BeaverWorks courses, and um, and then we select from among those students. Um, we end up, we don't control for, for geographical location, but as it turns out, the last two years, we tend to get a bi-coastal uh, uh, distribution, Northeast and California, for the most part. Um, 
with a couple kind of middle of the country. So uh, to deal with those logistical challenges, we had an East Coast lunch every day and a West Coast lunch every day. And people in the middle just had to uh, deal with it the best they could. Instructors mostly centered in Massachusetts and uh, New York area, uh, but with one uh, in the mountain time zone. Next. So one thing about our course is that, it's, and probably a lot of the courses really, it's very, uh, requires a wide variety of skills to, to, to be able to achieve the challenge. And so some of the basic building block skills, some of which we do in the spring course and some of which we taught a very small amount of, but uh, enough to get a toehold to do the challenge uh, during the course are listed here. So we, we present the students a very complicated problem, which we'll describe in a minute. And they have a basic tool set that they can try to uh, uh, use to tackle that challenge. And ultimately they have to work in teams and deal with teams and the version control and communication among teams and all of that. And, and uh, it, it can really be a challenge to uh, accomplish all of those things. Okay, so next. We based our system this year on a cloud computing cluster. Uh, so each student was assigned a, a virtual machine that they could use. A Linux machine, so they'd learn how to deal with Linux. Um, very powerful uh, operating system that they can use in their future as engineers. And um, then these uh, system, these individual virtual machines could be joined together into teams. And then those teams would play together on a game board on a different virtual machine. And we did this all on the DigitalOcean platform. Uh, so your students now have uh, capability to do lots of things. Uh, they could mine for uh, Bitcoin. They could uh, do lots of things on uh, distributed cloud computing systems. Uh, next. So the basic principle we are working with on an individual vehicle pro uh, 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 vehicle by vehicle uh, uh, basis is a backseat autonomy where, so a vehicle is manufactured, it has basic, basic controls that, you know, just like steering wheel, you know, I need to turn left, I turn, this, turn the wheel to the left, um, that sort of thing. And what we are working on is the autonomy, which we, we use the backseat autonomy uh, paradigm, which means that they need to develop autonomy software that will provide the control commands to the vehicle controller, and then the vehicle controller will execute those commands. Okay, next. The software that we used is Moose IVP, which is widely used in marine robotics autonomy, um, both in industry and academia. and and defense work and all of that. Um, the software was developed at MIT around 2000 when it was originally written, I think 2002. Um, it has the, the, the it has a lot of features, but the things that we liked it for were actually, uh, one, actually very well documented. Uh, so there's lots of documentation to, to dig through. Um, it is uh, configurable or it has configurable marine spe specific behaviors so they could leverage those behaviors to achieve their goals. Um, it, those behaviors are also extensible. You can write your own processes, your own behaviors, and, and merge them into the software suite. Uh, it handles ad hoc networking. So you have multiple vehicles and they maybe don't know about each other at the beginning of a mission. They see each other during the mission and we'll see why that's important. Uh, it has basic simulation of the environmental components. So we could do the whole thing in simulation. It would be very true to life and hand handles distributed autonomy. So we are working with multiple uh, platforms and we needed that feature next. So we put the students through a series of challenges. And the first challenge was to essentially get them to be able to control a vehicle using the Moose IVP software. And the, the story behind this one was to find a hat that was lost in the ocean while we were surveying a lake. And the students were each assigned a series of waypoints to go loiter to do a survey. And then there was a puzzle to try to figure out uh, where the hat was. And so the X marks the spot where the hat was. And on the right, you see the uh, optimal solution. And on the left, you see what uh, the students uh, successfully ac accomplished. This is now 24 individual student vehicles, each going to four different uh, loiter waypoints. And so you can see there, the controls were pretty good. Uh, didn't quite make a perfect picture, but it was a pretty good first step toward uh, doing you know, uh, multi-vehicle autonomy. So next slide. We then 
stepped it up a notch. The next challenge was for each each uh, student to control four vehicles simultaneously and have them able to for, create a formation. So 96 vehicle formation, and then at uh, individual uh, when when the command is issued for them to to distribute to, to disperse and go into a to a next formation. And so you see the three formations here uh, that the vehicles were in, and then if there were other vehicles that are circling the, the, the area there because they didn't have a spot to go to necessarily, so they had to do that as well. And, in, and they also had to avoid collisions among themselves as they went from point to point. So the vehicles uh, were traveling around. And then there was the puzzle, and the puzzle here is it's spelled out below. It's a phrase that came out of the first challenge, and it's written in, in Braille. So the students had to solve that puzzle based on uh, this was uh, tracking where fish were in their field. Okay, next. We also had the students design their own vehicles so these could participate in the challenge. You could have your own format of vehicle and these are just some examples of, of uh, design submissions design, uh, present, provided by students that we then put into the simulator and they could use that as their uh, vehicle form. Next, so then, then we were ready for the final challenge. And the final challenge was to, um, the storyline story behind it was the National Science Foundation is looking for a, a, a company to, to do uh, ocean, uh, fisheries monitoring in a given area. And, they, and these teams were so strong, they wanted to do a, a bake-off of which team would do the best, right? So they all proposed a uh, system of autonomous vehicles to survey a nine kilometer square area, so three kilometers on each side. Um, and they decided to say, okay, we're gonna have them survey this area uh, with uh, six vehicles per team. So each team had six members. Each member could provide a vehicle for their team. Uh, and in the challenge, there would be two teams at a time in the survey region. and. And so and each each task can only be done by one team. So they had to compete for that. And there's a 20 minute time limit per match. Uh, the, the challenges they had to do autonomously were one to well avoid collisions with other vehicles or their own vehicles, um, avoid sharks that were pursuing them, approach and attack whales that were trying to get away from them, approach and photograph fish at depth that were um, trying to avoid them, and to locate sunken treasures, retrieve them and carry them home. Okay, next slide. And we had a we came up with a point scoring system. So if you tag the whale, um, so they could only that could only be done by a surface vehicle. They will try to get away from you. That's fifty points. Um, if you uh, photographed a fish, uh, it could only be done by an underwater vehicle that had to match its depth. That was worth a hundred points. If you collected a UUV, there's there. I mean, sorry, collected a treasure it could only be done by an underwater vehicle. Um, and you could get a collection of points for that. One, finding it and picking it up was 200 points. Carrying it outside of the survey zone, so carrying it home was 250 points. And in theory, nobody did this. It'd be very difficult to achieve, but you could steal the treasure as someone was carrying it outside of the area and get 500 points for that. Additionally, the sharks were, were monitoring the area, and if they, if they saw you, they would chase you. Um, but if they, and if they caught you, then you would be timed out for two minutes. Your vehicle would be stationary. Okay. So next. So this leaves the students a lot of decisions to make. This is not a solve, solvable problem, really. It's not something that, that you, you can write an equation and get an answer. So what you're going to see in the following presentations is a result of their hard work and their ingenuity, really on how they approached the problem, how they, and how like the solutions that they uh, suggested and demonstrated. So, um, so among the decisions they had to make is like, how are they going to compose their vehicle swarms? They could take the fast moving surface vehicles or the slower moving underwater vehicles. They could get more points. How you divide those up? How are you going to search? What's your strategy for that? What's going to be your strategy for pursuing something? So once you see, for example, a whale and the whale starts to run away, what's going to be your strategy to try to chase it? Um, how are you going to deconflict among your your teammates, or or to deconflict them against the other team? If the other team is chasing a fish, are you going to chase it as well to try to beat it, or are you going to move on to the next task? Um, prioritizing task, which are you going to consider most important? You go for the high value points uh, tasks that are harder to achieve, or you can go for the, to try to collect a lot of low low point uh, tasks that are relatively easy. 
there's the balance between the predefined behaviors that are part of the Moose IVP framework, which are configured still by the, by the students. They still have to configure them, but they at least take, can take advantage of those predefined behaviors or customize behaviors and write your own and uh, achieve it in a new way. And then finally, there's the how are you going to handle communicating among your own team uh, of vehicles and to have one robot task another, say if a U.S. A surface vehicle observes a treasure, can't get to it, does it notify an underwater vehicle to go get it? Or how do you handle that strategy? So these are among the decisions they had to make while accomplishing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of sort of process oriented coding, bugging, uh, debugging, all of that. So um, you'll hear the stories of what they did. I, I think uh, it's pretty impressive what we saw from the students and, uh, and that will come out in their presentations, which we will see now. So I think that first, oh, actually we, we have the teams on the next slide. So this is the order that they'll be presenting. So the first team will be uh, Clownfish and then we'll go through the list as we go along. So these are the, the 24 students divided into four teams. So Clownfish, are you ready to show your presentation? Okay, thank you. So we are team Clownfish and this is our final presentation by um, Andrew, if you want. Oh, sorry, um, Andrew. Yeah, sure, Ada. I'm Kenji. Lisa. Amrita. And Vishwarya. Challenge. Um, and basically the challenge was to mimic a real AUV mission using a simulation with the Moose interface. And the goal of the mission was to retrieve a treasure and to photograph any fish we saw and to tag any, vehicle, any whales we encountered while avoiding the dangerous sharks circling the waters. And we received points for basically completing each task. Um, and we competed with other teams to score the highest number of points. So how do we do this and what was our strategy? Well, um, we were allowed to use up to six vehicles, so we chose to use six. And they were distributed between surface vehicles, known as USVs, and underwater vehicles, known as UUVs. And the USVs travel much faster than the UUVs, so they can um, search through an area quicker than a UUV in the same amount of time, and thus need fewer vehicles. And in general, the UUVs recover the treasure and kind of complete the tasks, while the USVs um, kind of search the area and, uh, and um, tell the UUV when they detect life forms or, the, or treasures, um, and communicate using P-Share, which is a sharing be behavior for the vehicle, um, to send it to the correct place. Um, so the vehicles need to search an area, and we believe that a lawnmower pattern, which you can see in the graphic to the right here, was the optimal way to do it. And essentially, the vehicles traverse the loiter pattern and move through the area until they see something out of the ordinary. Once they do, they go investigate it and interact appropriately. And after the interaction is completed, the vehicle returns to its loiter pattern and continues with it. Part of the final challenge was programming our vehicles to tag whales which meant that our vehicles needed to get within five meters of the whales in the X, Y direction, so disregarding depth. And the way that we did this at first was by programming a cut range behavior, which could either make the vehicle get closer to an object of choice or get closer to any object that it detects. And so uh, in this case, we programmed the behavior to uh, make the vehicle get close enough to a whale so that it could tag it. However, this behavior failed to make the vehicle's heading match the whale's heading. And as a result, uh, the, the vehicle would often end up uh, continuously circling around the whale and not actually getting closer to it, which is why we switched to the trail behavior, which actually accounts for the heading of the object being chased. The way that we even knew that there was a whale in the vicinity was by parsing through node reports and these node reports were constantly being updated to us. And uh, through that, we detected if there was a contact type whale. And if there was, we notified the vehicle that detected it to set its variable close to true, which in turn activated the, uh, the mode chasing. And when the contact type whale was detected, we set the target of the vehicle that detected it to the whale's full name so that it could chase after that whale. Another part of the challenge was avoiding the sharks patrolling the challenge area, which would chase after them if they got within a certain range and stun them for two minutes. And since two minutes was 20% of our total challenge time, 
which was 10 minutes to get as many uh, items as possible. We made this our highest priority behavior, which means that it took precedence over all of our other behaviors. And we used an implementation similar to the whale tagging behavior. Uh, we would parse through all the node reports and detect if there was a contact type shark uh, 100 meters away or less. And it, we set it to 100 meters because that was the max detection range. And if there was, we would notify the uh, vehicle that detected it to set its a uh, variable avoid to true, which in turn would set its mode avoiding, or in, in turn, it would activate its mode avoiding. And the behavior we used, which had its context set to the shark's full name once it was detected, was the ABD Colrex behavior. Okay, our third objective was to photograph the fish. And to do this, we needed to use the trail behavior and the depth behavior because to photograph the fish, we needed to get within 10 meters in the X, Y, and Z direction of the fish. So on the right, you can see a picture of the AUV descending to the depth of, of the fish in our simulation. And another thing we implemented in this action was to create a list of contacts, which we would check for repeats. So we would avoid, multi we would avoid um, photographing the same fish twice. In retrospect, it would have been better to check the mode of the fish because that would allow us to avoid um, photographing fish that other teams have photographed as well. So that would um, save our time and potentially allow us to gain more points. Um, our last um, objective was to find and retrieve the treasure. Um, we had this hour as our highest priority task because they were worth a lot more points than everything else could have it was one of the things that would make or break your, your game um so to do this we used the trail behavior and the depth behavior like we used with the fish we had to get within 10 meters of the treasure as well but we also needed to implement a return behavior so after the our vehicle would get within the 10 meters of the treasure the treasure would follow it and we would have to bring it to shore so we would then activate a return behavior where the UUV would um the UUV would um return to a designated point on the shoreline. So you can see on the right an image of our vehicle bringing uh the Queen's Anne's revenge to the shore. In order to successfully complete this challenge together, our team recognized the need to be able to collaborate effectively. This not only meant being able to help one another solve difficult problems, but it also meant being able to access the most updated code to see what has been changed and what needs to be done. We accomplished this flawlessly using GitHub. During the spring courses, every Beaverworks student has had to complete a GitHub practice course, which means that all of us, whether new or veteran GitHub users, already know how version control and Git works. While we've had a few hiccups regarding GitHub here and there, it's not something that our veteran users could not solve. And in just a few days of constantly pushing and pulling, committing and writing commit messages, all of us became very comfortable with this process. Our setup goes like this. We first connected our public repository, BWSI Clownfish, to the virtual machine where we run all of our code using the git clone command. Then we edited our code using Visual Studio Code. This allowed us to work on separate problems simultaneously with the branches and distribute code extremely easily using git push and pull. This descriptive grid logs that details from what files have been changed to exactly which pieces of code has been inserted or deleted kept everyone on the same cage. Ending with 37 major commits over the span of five days of this challenge. Which brings us to the process of writing this code. Before writing any code, our team first came up with a strategy to complete this challenge by first determining the number of underwater and surface vehicles that we wanted and the areas where they are going to loiter around to score points. Then we got to work. Right off the bat, our team realized that the vehicles used similar behaviors with similar configurations. For example, every vehicle has a follow behavior for when it senses a whale or a fish nearby or a rendering configuration in order to see the vehicles on the simulation. Thus, we coded a base file that is shared between all the different vehicles. In contrast, all the details that are difference between each vehicle, such as the loiter patterns, 
are being defined using variables to provide the different values to each individual vehicle. These are included in the launch file, where the individual vehicles are being initialized. Once we have the behaviors completed, we now need to make this underwater vehicle into an autonomous one. Using C++, we're able to read the vehicle's reports on the other objects within its sensing radius to determine what it should do next. Should they switch to their following behavior once it finds a whale? Or should they switch to their avoid behavior once it encounters a shark? Or should they just continue loitering if nothing is around them? These decisions are being handled in real time as you're able to follow the logic that we provide for them in order to complete the challenge tasks completely autonomously. Challenges we faced along the way. Needless to say, we faced a lot of challenges. Naturally, the code didn't work on the first test run or the many test runs after that. Um, we had to code behaviors in order to get the vehicles running, um, but obviously the behaviors often included a lot of bugs. For example, with syntax, um, with languages that a lot of us weren't really familiar with, like Bash and C++, and Moose documentation, it was kind of challenging for us to figure out how to use them. To make things worse, it often took some time to test our code and then to weed out the bugs. In this picture, we originally coded for the clownfish to follow the vaquita, but as you can see in the picture, it does not do that, and instead it just swims right past it. In the end, though, um, we got our code working in the limited sense of the word work that applies to our vehicles, because in day one, you see that we scored a total of zero points. So we all got together and um, improved our code for the second day, which was really great because luckily on game one, we got 650 points, which is much, much better than the first day. So that was a big win for us. And it was really great just to see um, all of our hard work pay off. On the left here, you can see this is like kind of what the competition game board looks like. Moving on to the applications of the things we learned. Throughout the course, we had the privilege of learning a bunch of things, including popular programming languages like C++ and Python, both of which are extremely important and versatile languages applicable to many things outside this course in the field of software development. We also learned things like Linux, Bash scripting, and Vim. Since a large portion of computers today are built upon Linux, this was important for us to learn. And although we hated the steep learning curve of Vim, it allowed us to quickly and efficiently write code without having to open a separate IDE. Moose IVP, on the other hand, allowed us to simulate our code and is extremely important when it comes to autonomous underwater vehicle missions. Throughout the combination of all these things, we were ultimately taught how to design and implement underwater, underwater vehicle software. AUVs are extremely important in the world, with over 70% of the Earth being covered in water. They are responsible for search and recovery missions, as well as marine life observation and collecting scientific data, which is becoming increasingly important as climate change continues to affect our planet. So what are our main takeaways from this entire experience? Well, firstly, I think all the members of this team learned a variety of new skills and tools that will be hugely beneficial to us in the future as we pursue a career in the field of engineering. Programming languages that we learned like C++ and Python gives a lot of flexibility to try out new things in the future and continue to program effectively. On top of this, the AUVC course gave us a sneak peek into the methods and skills engineers today use to design and conduct their projects. Finally, I'm proud to say that as a team, Clownfish learned to persevere through challenges. We went from scoring zero points throughout the entire first day of competition to over 1,400 points in the second day and making the finals. Although we have accomplished a lot, there are still a few improvements that we wish to eventually make through our project. The first one is fixing our treasure behavior to have priority over the other fish and whale behaviors. Furthermore, we'd like to incorporate code that would make our underwater vehicles return to the mission after depositing the treasure in the simulation. On top of this, we would like to include P-Share in the future so our vehicles can communicate to each other more effectively. We have a question from the audience. Um, someone asks, what happens if you are chasing, chasing a fish and a shark chases you at the same time? So we actually have our shark behavior um, at a higher priority than our fish. So basically it will stop chasing the fish and run away from the shark because if we're caught by the shark, that's obviously much worse than scoring just scoring points. We also have a bit of a correction. So 
Um, we intended for the treasure to be like the highest uh, priority besides the shark uh, task, of course, but uh, there were a few bugs and that's why we said that's something that we would improve on in the future. Another question from the audience is how exactly did you make the improvement between zero points to 1,415 points? What do you think was the key? So I guess one of the big things that helped us be able to get so much more points on the second day is, well, on the first day, there was, once again, many, many bugs that kind of restricted us from getting points. One of the few bugs that we had to solve was getting our vehicles onto the competition IP address. Since we're always, since we had, when we are running it on our own computers, we had run it on our local host. So that was one of the bugs we had to try to solve on the first day to be able to actually get our, our vehicles onto the competition. And just other bugs such as our loitering, not our loitering, fairness, our chasing behaviors and our logic to turn from loitering behaviors to chasing behaviors were like just some of the minor details that prevented us from scoring points. And so by the second day, we got a lot of it figured out, which really helped us a lot. All right. Thank you, uh, Clownfish. I think that's the questions we have and all the time we have for that presentation. Um, so next is what is water manatee? Or water cheetahs? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> which it is a team consisting of six members, Max, Caleb, Katie, Lily, Logan, and Raghav. In this presentation, we will be going over the strategies, uh, how well we competed, as well as some post-mission analysis and our successes and failures. So our initial plan was using three kayaks and three UVs in a lawnmower pattern to try to make them able to detect anything in its path efficiently and without using too many vehicles. The kayaks can alert UVs about anything around them so the UVs can dive correctly to tag the fish or whales. Because the UVs include go to death behavior to tag fish, whales, and to dive for treasure, then, using the information gathered, it should alert pecans by treasure. Next slide. After our initial plan had problems, we eventually cut down on what we wanted to sense. So we focused on capturing and moving treasure along with tagging whales. And we added a pea behavior as a backup in case autonomy failed. Next slide. Uh, we also, another tool we had planned on in our initial strategy was a prediction and fitting algorithm, which we called P-Challenge. Basically, it used C++ to parse incoming data our vehicles received from whales, sharks, and fish, and wrote that to a custom log. A Python script embedded in the C++ then extracted the locations of those animals over time and fit a function to their movements so we could predict where they were going. It also kept a running log of all of the locations in the operating area where our vehicles had searched, and provided live graphics about the state of our vehicle over time and created a live 3D plot of both the known and predicted locations of everything in the operating area. While P-Challenge was successful in all of these tasks, the amount of processing requ power required for accurate fitting with extremely limited data points limited its ability to work in real time, especially for longer missions as the delay between the data when, when the data was received and when results were posted kept growing, leading us not to use it after our first mission. So next, we're going to go over two of um, our missions, right? The semifinal rounds. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things kind of touched on before was the lawnmower pattern that we went for. So you can see our pattern is the, the pattern in white, and then the other team's pattern is orange, right? So you kind of see the lawnmowers going back and forth, right? Just along those lines. And that was kind of our, our main strategy. Um, Another thing is, another part of our strategy was to go for the chests, right? So the chests are the, the brown boxes. And you can actually see one of our, our UUVs going up to the top, uh, the yellow one on the, on the far right going up to the top. Unfortunately, um, we were unable to collect this chest because as it reached the, as it reached the actual spot, um, the machine just froze up. And you couldn't actually move it out of the location to get it to score our points. Uh, we ended up losing this match. Next slide, please. In our next match uh, against the manatees, we 
try for the same behavior, right? Just with an updated collect chest function to actually get it out. Um, but again, it didn't work, right? So the manatees had a pretty similar strategy to us um, for the lawnmower pattern just kind of scaled a little differently. Uh, and again, if you look at the chests, there's a bunch of manatees on the left and one of our UUVs trying to go for the chest on the far left. And, uh, and then the chest in the middle was again, almost to reach the chest, but unfortunately was unable to be collected. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is our post mission reconstruction. So uh, here's our first mission before, before the semifinals against the tank gang. Very creatively, you can see that we have called our vehicles one, two, three, four, five, and unexpected here, six. In this mission, our vehicle successfully loitered, but did not manage to tag any whales, fish, or find any treasure. We also attempted to run P-Challenge, and it accurately performed the fitting, but it was too slow. The delays built up, and by the time our vehicles were receiving predictions, the, prediction had our, the, predi the time the prediction had been for was already long past. However, our vehicles did manage to avoid the sharks through our avoidance behavior. Our built-in contact alarms were also successfully triggered, but the behaviors they were tied to didn't work, making them largely pointless. This plot was made with a variation of our P-Challenge software adapted for post-mission analysis. Next slide. Our second mission, against the clownfish, ran pretty much the same as the first. We didn't manage to tag anything, but we weren't caught by sharks either. The only change we made during this mission was turning off P-Challenge, which didn't affect our mission progress at all. Uh, next slide, please. Alright, in mission 3, our vehicles managed to successfully loiter and successfully avoid sharks. However, none of the rest of our behaviors worked. This means we couldn't gain any points through picking up treasures, uh, tagging whales, uh, and capturing fish. Um, so, in essence, this led to our loss because while our UUVs managed to successfully uh, stay alive, we weren't able to use our UUVs to gain any points to best our opponents. In our semifinals, our vehicles again managed to, success to successfully loiter, and our position fitting function managed to work, and we also successfully chased and caught several whales and avoided sharks. However, by the fact that we did not get any fish or treasures, and by the fact that we lost some of our log files, we were unable to win this match, and we were also unable to uh, review our data to find out what went wrong. In our second semifinals, our vehicles successfully loaded again, our position fitting function worked again, and we successfully chased and caught several whales and avoided our sharks again. However, again, we, we did not manage to get any fish or treasures, leading to our loss in the second semifinals as well, and we again lost some more of our log files, which led to our inability to diagnose the problems. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about some of our successes and failures. Uh, we had a few issues, for instance, to start with, our vehicles weren't moving. We fixed that by adding constant speed and depth behaviors. <clears throat> we also had a problem with our kayaks not properly chasing the whales, and they were circling around nothing. So we redid the behavior configurations, and we replaced cut range behaviors with trail behaviors. We also scored zero points during the first few matches, and most of our behaviors were not working. So we switched strategies and we redid the behavior configurations. We also had a few unresolved issues. So our fish photographic behavior didn't work and we ended up not getting it to work. We couldn't establish the communication we initially wanted between kayaks and UUVs. And UUVs couldn't properly drag away treasures. We did also have some successes. So we successfully created and operated both UUVs and USVs and survey patterns. We successfully chased and tagged several whales. We almost found several treasures. Only problem was we couldn't drag them away. Uh, we created novel processes and successfully predicted animal movements, albeit not in real time. And we successfully reconstructed our missions and did post-mortem analysis. And in the end, we ended up scoring 300 points across rounds. In conclusion, uh, programming autonomy is a very challenging process. Um, it requires a lot of problem solving and time. Um, however, uh, even through the difficulty, autonomy is a very useful tool and could be more effective than manual operation. We also learned that Moose IVP is also a very powerful tool when it comes to the development of underwater autonomy. 
We have a few questions for this team uh, from the audience. Um, in, in order. Um, how did you lose the log files? So we lost the log files because um, a lot of them ended up being like way too big. Like I think I think one of them was like three and a half gigabytes. And in order to move it to like a machine or like even to read it, we had to we had to cut down like over half or like over seventy five percent of each one. Next question is: whoop. It seems like you took a risk by going for the path prediction approach. How did you make the risk reward analysis to decide if it was worth the risk? Do you think given a bit more time, it would have been a key contributor to success? Um, so I think we basically did this by starting off at the beginning is aiming really, really high for what we wanted in an ideal situation. And ultimately, obviously, you can see how that played out. We fell short of that goal. Um, I think given more time, it definitely could have been adapted and made more efficient to work in real time. Um, and could have been a really crucial part of our strategy. However, we simply ran out of time to do it and encountered too many bugs in some of the other parts of our code that slowed down our progress and it was sidelined during the uh, development process. Okay, right. uh, one more question. A P challenge sounds really cool. How would you solve the calculation time issue that you encountered if you had more time to work on this? Um, so if we had a little more time to work on this, I think, we had done some of our fitting with mostly with tools built in Python, NumPy, SciPy. Um, instead of relying on these higher level Python tools, we probably should have could have built a lower level version of it in C++, which is a faster language, generally speaking, than Python, even though a lot of Python processes you were using were built in C++, which could have allowed us to customize it and made it a lot more efficient, as well as relying, as well as perhaps getting rid of our custom logging feature. Um, and just having it work off of already existing logs or keep a running tally of the data in a separate kind of data frame or just downsizing our basically how fine grained our prediction would our predictions were might have also helped. That's it for the questions. All right, that sounds like it's uh, manatees up next. Here there's a a computer issue that should be recovered now. So Manatee, is you ready? Right, hello everyone, this is Team Manatee's presentation. I'm Shane. I'm Brad. I'm Catherine. I'm Sam. I'm Varsha. I'm Darius. And um, so our challenge was to survey a 1500 meter by 1500 meter area and locate the most animals and treasures within our given time frame. Each team is given six vehicles to complete these four tasks. We had to get within five meters of a whale and tag it, get within five meters of a fish to photograph them, avoid sharks at all costs, and grab treasure underwater and bring it outside the 1500 meter boundaries. So here's a quick overview of how our program works. We really wanted to go for a simple approach to maximize how much time we could spend debugging and like proofing our code. So we did some testing and we realized that um, with three surface vehicles, it's enough to cover the entire width of the area and scan all the whales. So we decided to go with three kayaks. Um, as for our code, once again, we want it to be as simple as possible. So every time the uh, vehicle detects something nearby, it first asks if it's a shark, if it's a shark, it will run away no matter what. Um, if it's a whale, then it will ask if the whale has already been tagged. If it has, obviously it'll ignore it. But if it has not been tagged, it will then ask whether it is already chasing a different whale. And if a different whale is already being chased, it won't chase this new whale. But if it's not currently chasing any whale, then it will chase this new whale. As for the underwater vehicles, we realized that they're so slow that even with six, we usually can't cover the entire field. So instead of trying to sacrifice our surface vehicles, we decided just to use only three of these. Uh, as for the code, it's fairly similar to our um, surface code. The only difference being that after it confirms that there are no sharks nearby, it then first looks for nearby treasure. 
And if it sees a treasure nearby, it will go for that no matter how many fish are nearby. And if there are no treasure nearby, then it will just look for fish as normal. So problems encountered. So our first problem was that our vehicles kept stopping randomly. As discussed previously, our vehicles needed to chase and photograph fish. However, as we attempted to do this, the vehicles would randomly stop. We realized that the problem was that the code initially kept setting our speed to zero at random times, causing the vehicle to stop. So we configured a behavior, constant speed, that made the vehicle remain at a specific speed, the max speed, the entire time. Um, for our next problem, our vehicles kept circling a fish for far too long. Our instructors joked around with us about it, and though that was fun, we knew we needed a solution. We realized that the whales, uh, the vehicles kept circling the fish for so long because the rate of change of the depth of the vehicle was too slow. So it kept just descending and descending and descending to try to get the fish, but it just didn't get there fast enough because it was too slow. So we changed the depth rate and speed to the max speed that the vehicles were allowed to go in order to prevent the vehicle from spinning too long and get to the fish faster. So our third problem was that the vehicles kept missing their targets. So sometimes our vehicles would head towards a whale or fish and just narrowly miss it every time. And then the solution was that instead of programming our vehicles to try to follow their targets, we instead programmed them to prioritize just getting as close as possible, not just going, not just following them. So our next problem was um, erratic mode switching. So during our initial tests, our vehicles would randomly switch between uh, the searching mode where they're searching for nearby, um, nearby entities and chasing mode um, where they're just actively chasing an entity. So even when an untagged fish or a whale was nearby, so we should have like switched over instead. So the solution, we uh, realized that our code actually ran faster than the rate at which our sensors were reporting uh, the nearby targets. So uh, what we did was uh, setting our comp stick to eight. So the comp stick is the rate at which it asks for a node report, the data of like the cr vehicle's current state uh, per second. And then we updated aptic to one, which is the rate at which the entire code loops per second. So the sensors could keep up and with the code. So um, these are, uh, this is the final outcome. So our project was very successful at detecting the vehicles and tagging them, uh, detecting vehicles and tagging the whales, uh, fishes and treasure. Um, the first couple rounds, we uh, scored about 300 and 450 points. Within the final rounds, after making our adjustments, um, we scored 1,300, 1,600, and due to a technical difficulty, around uh, 3.7 billion. Um, so there are still a few improvements that we could have made, but yeah. So some of the potential improvements that we found, um, the first one was program treasure removal behavior. Our program was very effective at picking up the treasure. It identified it really well. It changed its depth really well. But when it actually reached the treasure, it had no way of dragging it out of the out of bounds. Instead, it was programmed to just continue its loitering pattern and hope that it would reach close enough to the edge and leave the treasure there. Um, this didn't affect our tests a lot, but it did cause our vehicle to be inefficient because there were multiple times where we picked up treasure and it barely got to the boundary and didn't count for points. So potential improvement number two that we identified was um, communication between the vehicles. Our vehicles are programmed to be fully independent of one another because in order to add communication between them, it would have taken a lot more time that we didn't have. 
but this did cause some problems as at one point we had two vehicles fighting over the same fish or whale, um, as you can see in the picture down below. But if we did have communication between vehicles, uh, our system would have been a lot more effective because then vehicles would be able to notify other vehicles of nearby animals and identify the one that was closest. Um, that is our presentation and thank you for watching. We have a question from the audience. Um, they want to know, since the underwater vehicles were so slow, how much of the area did they cover? Could you use the service vehicles to direct the underwater vehicles to treasure? This is two questions. This person needs to like learn to separate their questions. <laughs> you have two questions. <laughs> um, one of our goals was in fact to like have our surface vehicles find treasure and then tell our underwater ones to go look for it. But we ultimately ran out of time to implement that. So no, they did not do that. Um, generally with our three surface vehicles, they can cover about a third of the field. Sometimes go down a bit if there's no fish in the first third, but usually about a third of the field is how much we can get covered. All right, you must have wowed the audience because I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Should we have our last team? Yeah, it should be Tank Gang. Tank Gang. I'll make ready. sure we don't uh, run over time because I have a feeling that the main Beaver Works will be without us. Hi, I'm Akshaya and part of the team Tank Gang, a participant in the 2022 AUV Challenge with my other team members, Bernie, David, Leo, Linnea, and Jess. Today, we'll be discussing our approach to our final challenge and lessons learned. The challenge, as a quick recap, prompts teams to deploy autonomous marine vehicles with custom ridden behaviors to accomplish different tasks, such as tagging rails and profiling fish in a given time limit and under certain constraints. Tasks include tagging rails with surface vehicles, profiling fish with underwater vehicles, and recovering treasure with underwater vehicles. The goal of the challenge was to score as many points as possible by completing as many tasks as possible. With this goal in mind, our development philosophy was to encourage as many interceptions as possible. From a vehicle manipulation and strategy standpoint, this meant maximizing speed at all times, splitting the field between vehicles efficiently, and biasing towards underwater vehicles due to their higher score potential. To explain how we implemented our philosophy, we should explain the two types of code we use, processes and behaviors. Processes are functions that pass info between UAVs and auxiliary software such as GUIs. Examples are P-Share, which shares information between different vehicles using IP addresses generated by a virtual machine, and P-Challenge, which was our custom process to pass info between targets and vehicles. Behaviors are specific sets of actions that can be dynamically called with info from processes. Here are some of the behaviors we used to accomplish the actions we wanted the vehicles to undertake. To scan the field, we used waypoint and the lawnmower configuration, shown on the right. To avoid threats like sharks that would disable our vehicle, we used avoid coal regs, which recognizes vehicles and plots an escape path to exit a given radius. The dilemma of choice came when deciding how to approach targets. We decided on trail over cut range because we were more familiar with configuring it and it was less aggressive meaning other behaviors were more predictable. We had an issue with getting trail and descending to fish depth, so we implemented station keep to track a fish while descending. We then implemented constant depth instead of go to depth because constant depth required no time parameter and was simpler to configure. Our initial strategy based off all of this would have been two unmanned uh, surface vehicles or USVs and four unmanned underwater vehicles or UUVs. Um, each vehicle would patrol half the field at a different depth. If you imagine the field as a rectangular prism, this allowed us to sweep through an entire chunk of the prism at a time. The diagram at the right explains the general vehicle movement and vehicle depths decided based on vehicle Z as the sensing range. Each vehicle would be responsible for targets within its depth range. Ultimately, though, we never followed this initial strategy. We were instead only able to implement the Oops All Whale strategy on the first day, which consisted of six USVs, each covering a sixth of the field, targeting whales across the field. 
Once we configured a working fish behavior the next day, we implemented the quadrant strategy, which consisted of two USVs on each half of the field targeting whales and four UUVs with a quarter of the field targeting fish. Um, these new strategies were developed based on the working behaviors we had at this point in time. We faced quite a few challenges when coding our behaviors. The first was understanding and creating our own custom process P challenge. We then faced issues with configuring our trail pattern to follow a whale based on contact, uh, updates passed from P challenge. Um, some more significant issues were with version control as we didn't use GitHub. So distribution of coding workload was hindered and there may, may have been less innovation from the collective team in developing the autonomy processes. We also had issues with having two types of constant death behaviors, which is solved with different trigger variables and names. We also attempted to have a bimodal vehicle-based behavior file, which would change into a UUV-specific behavior or USV-specific behavior file by using hashtag ifdef, which functions as an if statement in Moose IDP using variables launched on or passed from the launch file. We also saw issues with the formatting and replicating the IPP missions where we saw it used. Um, so we just decided to create two base files instead of a single switching one. Um, lastly, a big focus during development was creating as few branching files and preventing spaghetti S code in our process. So a lot of variable changes to trigger behavior were the same for fish and whales, which obviously isn't very good. Um, this was fixed when we implemented separate trigger variables and different base and behavior files. We also faced some minor issues during testing. One was with P challenge shoreside, a process that calculates our mission's cumulative points. On our machines, whales did not trigger points, so we had to visually confirm contact success. This wasn't an issue when running games on an instructor's host VM though. Uh, we also had some quality of life issues like navigating direct feeders to constantly remake CPP files and executing long commands, which were alleviated by adding functions and aliases to our .bash RC script. Lastly, we saw some issues with high warp speeds, which essentially accelerated the mission and intermittent launch issues with PHELM IVP, both of which returned a lot of runtime warnings. Um, these may have been device or mission specific and were left unresolved. Now we'll be covering our performance in each of the challenge games based on the code we developed. So game one was our first game. And as we did not have much time to create behaviors for fish and treasure, which were a lot more complicated than whales, we only implemented a whale behavior for this first round following the oops all whales strategy. On the left, you can see how the oops all whales sections the field into six equal sections. And on the bottom left, you can see the red USB Dalvin approaching the green northern bottlenose dolphin showing our trail behavior working. The behavior was a bit inconsistent though, and at some points our vehicles were very close to the whales but did not detect them, which was due to too low of a sensitivity set in the P-Challenge moose plug. We managed to win 100 to 0, but overall the behaviors needed a bit of improvement. In our next match, we made adjustments to our behaviors, but our fish behavior was not ready yet. Therefore, we used the same strategy as in game one, where we prioritized USVs over UUVs and searched for whales. Because we increased sensitivity, max and minimum chase distance, we were able to track whales longer and more accurately. We also had more whales spawning directly in our waypoint path as a matter of luck. However, our competitors had their fish behaviors ready and running, so they were able to score more due to their ability to collect points, not only from whales, but also from fish. Although we lost this match, we did score 300 points. In this round, game seven, we scored 650 points using the quadrant strategy with their newly implemented fish tracking. On the left, you can see that the field now has two almost halves instead of six for vehicle scanning, Thanks to our new strategy and spawns close to our initial start positions, we scored 650 points, and this was our highest score across all games. This was our final game, still running the quadrant strategy. One on the top left, you can see the UUV Kelvin successfully approaching lanternfish was the station key visual indicator. This game began with a slow start as wildfires strayed far from our waypoint path yet we were able to pick up later on and gather 200 points by the end of the match. However, we lost this final match. The biggest issues were with the opponent tagging fish and whales before we do, as well as redundant USV movements as shown as on the bottom left. Elvin and Belvin converge to share detection space when it's not really needed.
To summarize some of our reflections, we saw that our biggest hurdle was with time management, which led to much simpler code that didn't rely on as many conditional reports from other targets or vehicles as we would have liked. Um, however, this did help the code become much more robust and prevented the propagation of many bugs. And it also let us see pretty good performance with our whale and fish tracking. However, we should have been more comprehensive in our peach challenge planning stage as part of the issue was implementing treasure um, or or part of the issue with implementing Treasure was that we'd have to rewrite a lot of the base information uh, passing that we had in our pchallenge CPP file. A more comprehensive plan or flow charting the pchallenge uh, process at the start of the challenge might have helped with this. Some future improvements we'd like to make would be to add pshare functions to pass target info between vehicles to encourage direct movement to specific targets. This would essentially extend the effective range of a vehicle to its farthest group member. Obviously, implementing treasure recovery is also a major goal, and the steps to get there, including better documenting our changes and making pchallenge more modular, are improvements to make as well. Lastly, removing luck as a factor from our vehicle performance by optimizing waypoint patterns is another improvement to make for consistent results. And that ends our presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Right, a uh, question for you. Um, this, you switched from six USVs to two for the quadrant strategy. Did this cost you any points in tagging whales? Um, so just to answer that, we did lose, I guess, some potential whales because they were evenly distributed for a couple of games. Um, but we decided to go with uh, two USVs instead of just like six or a greater number because um, the points that could be acquired from fish were almost double. So we focused more on fish and then you know, just like dedicating more resources to that uh, did net us more points overall. Hopefully that answers it. If, uh... Another question is, um, my understanding is that GitHub is used to speed collaboration and help with version control. Did you find it to be different? Oh, I will clarify that. Um, I, it, it might not have been super clear in the presentation. Um, I said did not, we did not use GitHub. Um, we, should have probably, but it didn't occur to us. Are there any other questions? I think that's it from the outside audience. I thought maybe do we want to open it up to questions from team to team. I don't know if we even had an opportunity to to ask questions at the end of the challenge. Do any of the teams have questions for the other teams about their strategies and approaches? Did anyone like get any form of like between robot communication working at all? No. Like fledgling stages. We asked this already. <laughs> yeah. Like no one answered your question. No, 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 I'm gonna get now. I brought you. You said you didn't have it. I know that. And then we we tried to do it, but we didn't get it to work. Okay. Well, yeah. Lisa texted me about it, and I was like, "No, we're still getting our whale to work." <laughs> we have a while to go. Lisa made a branch on GitHub about his uh, P share um, solution, which did not come to fruition in the end. Same vein of questioning. Did anyone have like a working, fully functioning treasure behavior? Like just for treasure? No, oh, okay. That's good that they, we, we actually intended it to be, um, uh, th to make it so that you probably couldn't do everything. But I guess the, I would be interested to know like how, how much more time do you think it would take if we were to, if we were to aim for people to have working treasure behaviors and inter-vehicle communications. Do you have a sense for that? Probably like an hour or two for treasure behaviors like just by itself. Like just removing treasure out. Most of you just copy from the fish. Communication definitely longer than that though. Not an hour for us. <laughs> Probably an extra day and then also like, cause the way we set it up was a little bit different. I think um, we were kind of confused with the challenge. So like we kind of put a lot of time in like testing it out. And then once we actually asked people for help, which was should have been done earlier, we figured it out pretty quickly and implemented it better. Um, but like when we did that, we kind of rushed it and then didn't think about adding treasure in at a later point. So we'd have to change a lot of like the base, like if statements conditionals to like sort of account for treasure. I think for maybe just the behaviors for each other thing. Yeah, like they said, an hour might be sufficient, but I feel like the p-share part of it might take much longer because 
the debugging of that section might become like overwhelming eventually since there's going to be much more reports across every single vehicle so maybe like an extra entire extra day for the p share might get it working but to be honest i'm just still quite skeptical if an, an extra day might work for p share i think i think it would take at least a day, at least a day to get both of those working probably a day and a half maybe. i think it'd be a day just to like program something and then at least another day to like debug it and make sure it's actually working properly and efficiently and like practical We're getting a few more questions from the external audience um, for everybody. How different would it have been if it had been in person? What do you imagine would have been different about the class? In person, we will get to have the physical AV, right? To try and let it run. So maybe that would be much more entertaining to watch. How would you see the UV? I think it would be a collaboration a lot easier if it was in person. It's kind of hard to like collaborate with teammates on Zoom. I would also assume um, it would be like a closer, like a hardware based course, or more of it would be hardware focused because there's actual like physics to worry about now instead of like whatnot. And then, yeah, definitely having an in person would have, I think, made the team aspect better, although my team was pretty great. Um, and I think like, outside of obviously the class time or we can just like pile into one dorm and just like code to get things done faster yeah it would have been easier to ask for help from both instructors and other students um but here i guess with the virtual format it's a lot, i guess i'd say it's a little bit intimidating to have to go out put yourself out there and ask questions but in person it would have been a little easier i guess one thing that might not have happened though is if we're all in person I think instead of using github repositories we might have just went to each other's computers and be like hey let's code together but like since it was online github I guess made it much easier which I don't think we would have even thought of if it was in person I will say one concern sorry. though is oh, oh sorry you want to go ahead Logan yeah oh I was trying Ernie, to see sorry that. yeah I think it would have been harder to run some more complicated missions because for some of them, we ran them on like warp 10, warp three. But if we were doing an actual AUV, we wouldn't be able to do that. So we would have to run it at the normal speed, which would probably take a long time. Well, I figured if it was in the pool, the field would have been much smaller, but that I feel like getting access to constant testing would have been an issue. Um, you have to like make sure your code is actually non-bugged before you get like, what I'm assuming would be more of a rare chance like set up the AUV, get it in the water, all of that. Yeah, I think I think ironically, if we were in person, everyone would probably be trying to figure out how to get the simulation with use of Marine to work. That's right, it'd be a completely different course from our perspective, right? Because we, we, like, we wouldn't be able to run so many vehicles and have truth <laughs> where things were and, and or have you know, whales on it. So, we would change the course uh, significantly. It would be a lot more hardware focused, but you're right. You, you have to simulate, you have to simulate, I guess the thing about autonomy, you have to simulate lots and lots of missions in order to run one and know that it's going to work, right? So it would still be a lot of simulation. It'd just We'd be simulating a lot less vehicles. My other question, what advice do you have for next year's students? Plan out what you're doing before you do it especially if you don't know what you're doing, because most of the time. Debugging and, will always take longer than you think it will. Yeah, and also, like, don't just wing it. Have a clear-cut plan before and don't procrastinate and don't spend too much, don't spend too much time on the planning because if you do, you're not going to have enough time to actually execute. Like, that was one of the problems we had. Also, ask for help. Help, uh, even if you think what you're asking is done, and even if the instructors think what you're asking is done, which they might, I don't know. I ask a lot of command line questions. Um, they won't say it, and then you'll usually get some answer. It'll be really comprehensive, and it'll make you work a lot faster than if you just try to figure everything out on your own. Yeah, adding on to David's point, you should always try to collaborate with other students because sometimes other people know more about one aspect of the mission or the simulation than you do. 
and you can put your strengths together to complete the mission faster and better. Actually, building on both of those, just because something works, if something doesn't work, does not mean it's like something wrong with like some fine detail. You did. Sometimes there are very stupid things that you will overlook that seem trivially simple and like in like um, hindsight. But when something doesn't work, please check like the very basic thing that you thought you did. Because oftentimes it's just something simple that you missed. Well, also, on that note, watch out for typos. Okay. Uh, if your code doesn't work, then don't just throw it away. Like com comment it out or like save it somewhere or something. Don't overwrite it or anything. Otherwise, you won't be able to go back to it and figure out what's wrong. Yeah, I had an error where um, there was a typo, like Logan was saying, and I just simply could not catch it. I had no idea what, what was happening. And I asked Joe, and he told me um, to put an echo statement, which means like just printing out um, exactly what the program is doing. And that helped, that helped us spot where the error was. So that's like another super helpful tool when debugging, just printing out exactly what your code is doing. I guess if you're gonna use GitHub, make sure you check what you're pushing and pulling. Like this is one time I accidentally pushed the entire log files onto the GitHub and then I had to delete all of it, which took a really long time. Since if you check the open repository now, you see that I have commits like 300,000 different commits, which was a mistake. But yeah, that was a oopsie by me. So just make sure you're like knowing what you're pushing and pulling and checking, make sure it is something that you want to do. Also, you don't have to rewrite your code every single time you start a new project. A lot of times you can copy previous code and make minor edits to it, which not only is easier for you, it's also more time efficient. So don't not just, you know, reuse what you already have. Don't make new code every single time. It's a lot of very good advice, which I, Really happy to hear because that's part of the, the uh, reasons we uh, created the challenge the way it was. Because actually, we saw lots of it at the beginning. Uh, people push forward with their code and wouldn't take the time to go, yeah, like like Varsha said, like print out what it thinks it's doing. There's so many just typo errors and things like that. And also learning how to be efficient, like, like Raj was just talking about. Um, and you were in a limited space, limited amount of time, all that thing. So, all these things became important. We're really happy to hear you took some of those lessons and now you're passing them on to our audience. So I think we are at the end of our time here. So uh, we'll wrap up this session and move on to there's awards and things like that, I think, following. Uh, so this room will be closing now at 120. So yeah, congratulations and see you all back at the main party.